Amen. So Hebrews chapter 13 tonight, the title of the message is Never Alone. Never Alone. And uh, I really appreciated the fact that, you know, we sang some songs. The first song we sang this morning, or this evening rather, was uh, How Can I Be Lonely? So sometimes you write a sermon, I wonder, you know, is this really what I should be preaching? And then that happens, and I think, man, this is exactly what I need to be preaching. So I believe that God does do that type of thing from time to time to kind of confirm things for us. So uh, anyway, the cert like I said, the, the title of the sermon is uh, Never Alone. And he begins there in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. It says, Let brotherly love continue. And he says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have enter uh, entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and, as, uh, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all, the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So, of course, verse 5 there is a very precious promise. It's the same thing. It's quoting what was uh, God said to Joshua before he went into the promised land, telling him to be strong and of good courage. And he told him, you know, you need to be strong, you need to be courageous because of the fact that I am never going to forsake you, that I am going to be with you. And really, that's something that we need to apply in our own lives today because of the fact that we get lonely, you know, uh, you know, different seasons in life. You know, maybe we're here tonight and we say, I'm not lonely. Everything's great. Well, you know, there's probably people in the room that are lonely, um, whether they actually are physically alone in life from time to time or the vast majority of the time, maybe even inwardly. You know, somebody with a family can uh, feel alone at times. Or <coughs> so we should never... <coughs> excuse me. Excuse me. <coughs> so we should never feel like, uh, you know, although we're not lonely today, that that might not be something that comes to us later in life. Uh, we're going to go through these seasons of, of loneliness in our life. And of course, you know, the holiday season kind of has that stigma of, you know, this is a very uh, trying time for some people. And I'm sure that it is. And uh, when I was writing this, I thought, well, I remember having heard, you know, uh, th that the, the holiday season is when the, the suicide rates spike because of depression. It's actually the complete opposite. That's a, that's a myth. It's actually when it's the lowest. So, but that's not to say that people still don't struggle with depression during this time of year, a time when people are coming together with family, people are spending time with loved ones. Often we might find ourselves you know, missing somebody that used to be part of our lives, or we find ourselves not having many people to spend that, that precious time with, that dear time with, and we start to feel lonely. So I thought this would be an appropriate uh, sermon for the year. And just to remind us that, you know, we're never alone. I was thinking about it even today, like I mentioned earlier announcements, when I'm walking down the streets, I was going door to door by myself. But, you know, I was, you know, it, you could get a little lonely when you're out there doing it by yourself. I thought about, you know, our own pastor who, when he started this church, spent a lot of time knocking doors by himself or just with his young children. And, you know, I don't know if that was the case for him, but I could definitely see how a person in that position could start to feel lonely and say, I'm the only one. You know, where is everybody else? Why am I doing this? And I'm reminded of that as I was out there today, and I just thought to myself, well, you know, the Lord is with me. You know, we're out doing His work, and, and that's, a, that's something that we should take to heart. And again, maybe it's not going to apply to you this evening, but I guarantee you, if you live long enough, there's going to come a time in your life where you're going to feel alone. And we need to know where these passages are and understand these promises from the Word of God, such as this one where God says, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So what's interesting here is that God, you know, you, you see several other relationships in this passage. You got that in our mention. Of course, you see in verse 1, let brotherly love continue, right? He says there, you know, uh, you know, that's something that we should have in this life. You know, that's a source of fellowship. That's a source that would help us deal with loneliness to some degree is if we have, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ. That's a very important relationship. He also mentions in verse 4, you know, the marriage. You know, so marriage is honorable and all. You know, that could be a big cure for a lot of people's loneliness. You know, they're, they're moving through life uh, single and, and they're feeling alone. Well, you know, marriage gives you that fellowship. It gives you that companionship that man needs to have. But really, even in those situations, if you have those things, it still doesn't offer you the opportunity that having that companionship with Christ has. And in all these relationships, we understand the brotherly love and, and, and the marriage. God can be glorified through those relationships. But not, I don't believe, to the degree when you have a, a, a relationship, a close walk with the Lord. You are giving God glory on a regular basis. You know, the closer we are to God, the less lonely we feel. And not only that, but that relationship 
affords you the opportunity to give God glory. And really, uh, you know, that's, that's not something you can necessarily find to the, great, uh, uh, the, the same degree as in a friendship or in a marriage, even. So it is a relationship, you know, like all others, like all other relationships, a relationship that we have with God can be taken for granted. I mean, do we not sometimes take for granted our brethren in Christ? That's why it says there, let brotherly love continue. Don't stop it. Don't, you know, don't prevent it from happening. Because we can't take those relationships for granted. We can take one another for granted in Christ. Uh, even in a marriage, people can, you know, get used to each other. They can, you know, they, they can, you know, uh, just be around each other so much that they just kind of, you know, she, he knows she's stuck with him and she knows that he's stuck with her, that it's for life. And we can just start to say, well, you know, they're stuck with me, you know, and they're, 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 uh, they're, they're just going to be there no matter what. We can start to take these relationships for granted. And our relationship with God is no different. It's a relationship like any other relationship. And I know that that's kind of a term that we shy away from in these type of churches because it gets thrown around so much. Oh, I have a relationship with God, you know. But, you know, there is some truth to that, right? We do have a relationship. We have a father and son relationship. We have a child and father relationship with God. Uh, we have a friendship with Christ. We are, uh, he is our Savior. That is a relationship. There's no doubt about it. <coughs> But that relationship, like all others, can be taken for granted. They can say, well, I'm saved and I know that and just move on with their lives and not take the time to give God uh, the glory that we could be giving him if we would just stop and think about it. We could start to throw a pity party and we could start to feel really bad and start to you know, feel really alone. And, never, and we're, while you're doing that, you're, taking, you're, you're just showing how that you're taking that relationship for granted. That you really don't understand how close God really can be to you. Rather than sitting around and feeling sorry for ourselves and feeling alone, we should take that opportunity to draw closer to Christ. <coughs> so here's the thing about loneliness. You know, God does not want us to be alone. God does not want us to feel lonely. We all know in Genesis chapter 2, it is not good for the man to be alone. God said it is not good for a man to be alone. God wanted a help meet for him. God didn't want him, Adam living his life uh, by himself. God didn't want him getting lonely. Uh, the Bible, you know, speaks highly of, of, of marriage, and, and that's an, uh, an important relationship. He says, uh, let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. So we know that God doesn't want people to be alone. And we understand that. And many of us in this room, you know, we've taken that step. We are married. We have, brother, uh, we have brethren in Christ. We have a family here, a church family. But despite that, even, sometimes people will find themselves feeling alone. And even those that have, you know, family can be come, to come to feel very distant. I mean, families get broken up. Families uh, that have rifts in them. Families uh, start to drift apart. You know, uh, what we, the, you know something that we, a family that we were very fond of at one point can, can change. You know, I know that's been true in my own experience. And I'm sure many in this room can attest to that as well. So these relationships, you know, we, today we feel great. Today we're not alone. Today we have many friends. Today we have a great church. But there might come a time when we do begin to feel lonely. And it's at those times we have to understand something. We're never alone. We're never alone. We always have the Lord. Don't take that for granted. <coughs> Others will feel spiritually alone at times. We might feel like, well, we're the only one taking the stand. We're the only one that's standing up for Christ. We're the only one... Uh, you know, at the workplace or in our family or wherever it might be that's standing alone for God and we feel alone. Well, you know, that's, that's par for the course sometimes. Sometimes you have to go through that. But you have to remember that even in those times, you're never alone. In those times, we should probably reflect on other, you know, men of God, other Christians, other uh, of God's children that went through such trying times where they might have felt alone. I mean, you think Moses fleeing Egypt. We just read over these stories. We forgot that was an actual human being that went through that. They came up in Pharaoh's house, saw his brethren being mistreated, went out and tried to help them. Maybe went about it the wrong way. You know, I know first degree murder is the best thing to commit and to try and sway people, but yeah, that's what he did, you know, in his zeal. And he finds himself rejected of his own people, you know, and, 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 and has to flee into a foreign land. I mean, leaving the land that he grew up in to go wander around. You know, in the backside of some desert, and do that for many years. 
You know, uh, he probably had some nights on that journey where he felt pretty alone, like he was the only one. You think of Joseph, another person who probably experienced a great deal of loneliness. His own brethren taking him and throwing him in a pit and then selling him into bondage. I mean, how, what a heartbreaking story that is. And what if that happened to any one of us? I mean, or we heard of somebody having that happen to them. We would, we'd feel very bad for that person. No doubt Joseph felt very alone during that time. During all those years in the prison that he spent. Think about our Lord upon the cross. When he cried out, why hast thou forsaken me? The loneliness that he must have felt. So loneliness is something that it, it, it's, it's a fact of life. It's something that we go through. It's something that we're all going to experience from time to time. Some of us will probably go through some deeper seasons of it than others. Uh, but we have to remember, to whatever degree we're suffering loneliness, we're never really alone. And those that are feeling that, that are feeling, hey, I feel alone. I feel very lonely. You know, they're trying, they've got the relationships in church. They might even have the marriage relationship and that's doing great. But sometimes they still feel alone because they haven't taken advantage of that one relationship like they should have, which is Christ, and drawn close to Him. And even those that are even taking full advantage of that relationship, maybe all these things are going great. But we still feel that loneliness. The people that are actually going through this, this loneliness, these promises of God become more precious. We can't appreciate it sometimes when everything is going good. We can't, oh, I, I know the Bible says he'll never leave me, he'll forsake me, and, and that's nice. I appreciate that. I, I know where that is, and I've got it marked, and maybe one day I'll have to turn there, but not now. But I tell you what, the person that's going through that, they live in this verse. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That might be what gets them through a day. T to people that are suffering that, this promise becomes so much more precious. <clears throat> you can think of other such passages. Uh, Psalm 27. When my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. The psalmist there isn't saying, when my father and mother forsake me, you know, life as I know it is over. What's the point of going on? Nobody cares. No, he knew that he was never really alone. He knew that the Lord would be there. That the Lord, like we talked about this morning, is faithful. Great is thy faithfulness. That he would be there to lift him up, to take him up. Now, if you would, let's turn over to 2 Corinthians. You don't need to keep anything there in Hebrews. We're done there. But go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Second Corinthians chapter 1. When you get there, keep a bookmark in 2 Corinthians. Another one of these great passages that would, a person that's going through loneliness and not, you know, uh, is looking for that promise from God. Well, here's one for you. You got Hebrews 13. You got passages like Psalms 27. You got this one here as well. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 2 where it says, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of of all comfort who comfort us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God <laughs> verse 4 is a little wordy what he's saying there is like he's saying look God comforts us in all our tribulations that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble you know sometimes the reason why you're going through that trial is so that you can help somebody else in the future you know why does God let things happen to us sometimes so that we can help others, so that we can sympathize with another human being, so that we can know what it is that they're going through. But he says there in verse 3, that he is the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. You know, God is a multifaceted individual. He's not just one thing. He's a person like me and you, of course, far higher and, and greater in every way, but he's, he has a personality. When you read the Bible, you get to understand that. Of course, we're very familiar with the fact that uh, you know God uh, is ju judges and God has anger and God has wrath and God has hatred and God has great love. And not only that, but God comforts. I mean, that's what it says here, that he is the God of all comfort. You know, we're lonely, we're hurt. Where are we going to find relief? Where are we going to find help with God? 
You know, the, the church isn't always going to be enough. The, the relationships that you have on earth are not always going to be enough. For some of those things, uh, some of us that are, are suffering deep-seated loneliness, there's not going to be a relationship you can find on earth that's going to necessarily help it the way God could. He is the God of all comfort. So we need to understand these promises that we have and understand that God has promised to never leave us, that he will comfort us in all our tribulations, that we are never alone, even when we feel like it. It's just a matter of whether or not we know these, these passages, these promises. Now, as I said, keep up something there in 2 Corinthians 1. But let's turn over to John chapter 14. John chapter 14 is probably in the running with pro probably my favorite chapter, if not in the whole Bible, definitely in the New Testament. It's, it's one of the great, great chapters. John 14, John 15. But John 14 in particular, there in verse 16 where it says, And I will pray the Father... And he shall give you another comforter. What was he called again where we just read? The God of all comfort. And here this is a title that is given to the Holy Ghost. And he says he is the comforter. Now why does he call him that? Because he comforts us. And that's something that, you know, maybe that's not the most exciting topic to preach on. But it might be something that literally saves some people's lives brings them back from the brink of despair to understand that God is with them, that God loves them, and that they are not alone. He's the God, he is, he is the comforter, that he may abide with you forever. That he may abide with you forever. He's never going to leave us. We're sealed uh, with the, uh, unto the day of our redemption, the Spirit. We have the indwelling of Christ forever. That's a precious promise. That's something we need to get our minds around, especially if we're suffering with loneliness. He says, Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. How close is God? How close is the Comforter tonight with you? The Bible says he's with you and that he's in you. He's abiding in our hearts by faith. That's, that's, that's a very close relationship. There's none closer. He said in verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. <coughs> so we experience this closeness. To say, well, you know, I, I am feeling lonely. And I understand these promises, but how do I actually access that? How do I actually go about experiencing the closeness of Christ? How do I actually experience uh, knowing that God is with me? Well, you do that through the Holy Ghost. And that's what it's showing us here. You, read that, you do that through the closeness of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> that, that name in itself is, is given to imply this attribute of God's care. I mean, look down there in verse 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. Who's the comforter? It's the Holy Ghost. That is in you. That is with you forever. That's how you experience that. That's how you get over that loneliness. That's how you get through that dark season of loneliness in your life. It's through the Holy Ghost. I mean, the brethren in Christ help. The church family helps. Uh, close friends help. But that's not always going to be enough for us. You know, if we have that marriage relationship, that helps. But we have this relationship. It's available to all of us if we're saved at any age at any season in life, if we're ever feeling lonely, that we it's right here. It's in us. It's, it's right there at our fingertips. It's right here in the Word of God. The Holy Ghost is there to see us through. <clears throat> now, I do want to kind of get into the thrust of this here and, and, and make application. And what I want us to understand tonight, that this is a precious promise, no doubt. And whether we need that right now or not, we might one day. It's good to know this. It's one of the great promises of the Word of God that God is with us, but let me say this, it is not without requirements. There are requirements on having that comfort come to you, that, that, that comfort that can see you through a season of loneliness. Now, disclaimer, of course, we understand once saved, always saved. I don't feel like I need to go into that here with this group. We understand once we're saved, we're always saved. That's not what I'm saying tonight, that somehow the Holy Spirit's going to be taken from you and you're no longer saved. 
That's not what I'm saying at all. We're sealed. Okay? We've already been bought. We're just waiting to be redeemed. But what I am saying is that there are degrees to closeness with God. Not every Christian that's born again is at the same, has the same uh, degree of closeness to God. Some people are farther away from God than others. I mean, that's, that's just a fact of the matter. And it's all dependent. And any, any one of us can be as close to, to, to God as anybody else. I mean, you see that, you know, a great picture of that is the 12 disciples. You know, there was the 12, right? And then there was the inner circle of the three, Peter, James, and John. You always see God taking, you know, Jesus is always taking those three. The 12 are always with him, but when, it, when special things, when he's raising the, the young maid from the dead, the transfiguration on the mount, not everybody was as close. There was a certain group of men that God was just a little bit closer. And then even within the three, there was John, wasn't there? That disciple whom Jesus loved, the one who leaned upon his breast. So, you know, that should be a goal in our life. How close can you get? And you say, well, is it really that important? Well, you know, it's probably might see you through a dark season in your life. We talked about it this morning. Thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Life is full of unsuspected, uh, unexpected surprises. You might need to lean real heavy on these promises one day. So we should understand them now and we should uh, always be ready to, 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 to call upon the Lord and, and seek to draw close to Him now before that season even comes. Be prepared for it. Now, there are some requirements and the one requirement that God puts on this and we'll see here in John 14 is obedience. Well, I want to get closer to God. I want to be with God. I'm, I'm, I'm lonely. I want to feel him, uh, I want to be comforted by him. I want to know that he's with me. I want to uh, have that in my life. Well, then you need to be obedient. It's not just going to happen on its, on its own. You have to do your part as well, like we talked about this morning. That requirement is obedience. Look there in verse 15. He says, if you love me, oh, I love God. Okay. If you love me, keep my commandments. You know how much you, you know how you can tell somebody if somebody loves God, they keep his commandments. That's that, that you know the degree to which you love God will be instantly reflected as and in, 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 in how much you keep His commandments. To what degree you keep God's commandments, that's going to show us how much you love God. <clears throat> if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever. He says, "Look, keep my commandments, and I'll give you a Comforter." You see, God does distance himself from the disobedient. You know, and I'm not saying that's why we're always feeling, you know, if you're feeling lonely, it's not necessarily just because you're disobedient. It might be. But God, what we need to understand is that God does distance himself from disobedient children. I mean, think about it, you parents in your own life, with your kids. When the kid is just being a snot, you know, when they're just being a pain in the neck, you're always having to deal with them. I mean, is, is that the kid you're going to want to spend your whole day with? You got something special to do. You got some special trip that you can take or you're going out. You know how kids, the, we, we look at it such a mundane thing. I'm going to go to the grocery store. I'm going to go fill the car up with gas. Oh, can I go? Can I go? Kids just, clan, they just love to do that kind of thing. Just, just to be around dad or mom and go do these silly mundane tasks that we as parents loathe, right? And it's great to have the kids because it makes it, you know, interesting. You never know what they're going to say. But if you're that parent and you've got one kid that's just been the sweet, charming, obedient angel that you know they all could be if they wanted to, you have that one and then you have this whining, complaining, just pain in the neck. Which one are you going to take with you on that trip? Which one are you going to want to spend time with? for 20, 30 minutes, an hour on the road? Uh, well, I think we all know the answer. I think it's the same way with God. God distanced himself. like, look, you, you need to get, an atti get your attitude right. Why would I want to hang around you when you don't obey? When you're just a pain in the neck? I'm going to go spend my time with this one over here, this child who's keeping my commandments, who's loving me, who pr appreciates me, it wants to please me. So there are requirements, mainly just one really, and it is obedience. And we need to understand that God does distance himself 
from the disobedient. Now, keep something in John. And let's turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. If you kept something there, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> well, I want to be close to God. I want to be near God. I want to know that God is like a father to me. Well, look at verse 17, 2 Corinthians 6. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Sounds like a requirement to me. That there's something we have to do on our part if we want verse 18 to apply. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. God, uh, the Lord Almighty. Well, I want to know God is my father. And look, again, I understand. We're saved. God's our father. That's never going to change. But, you know, even on this earth, you know, some of us have fathers that our relationships are very, very distant. You know, uh, and, and not every father, just because he's your dad, is necessarily a close parent. And sometimes that relationship, that same thing can happen with us and God. Not, on God, not that it's God's fault, but that, you know, we get out of sorts. We don't want to come out from among them. We don't want to stop touching the unclean thing. We want to keep... Uh, doing those things which God uh, disapproves of. And he says, well, you know what? I am, although God is, again, uh, is a father unto us. We know that. He said, I'm not going to be as a father unto you. Or maybe he's going to be a father unto us in ways we'd rather he didn't. <laughs> you know, the chastening hand of God. Where he chastens every son whom he receiveth. That's not the, you know, that's not the relationship I desire to have with my kids. Or it's just a constant, you know, beating 24 hours a day and it's not praise God right but there are seasons aren't there <coughs> we have to understand something these promises are precious but they come with a requirement and God distances himself from the disobedient and God's proximity to us how close we are to God is directly propor proportional to our obedience the more obedient you are, the more you love God, you know what? The closer you are to God. The closer we get to God. I mean, I know that's true in my own life. Seasons of life where I drifted away and God just seems so far away. Then you have to stop and check, well, why is that? Oh, because this sin's in my life? Because I'm not doing this and I'm not doing this? And this sin is in my life and I haven't gotten this right? And I have, I'm not, you know, it piles up. It doesn't take long. We go, oh, that's why God seems so far away. That's why I feel so alone. Because I've pushed everyone away and, and God seems far away because we're not obedient. And if we begin to obey, you just be like us with our own children. Come a little closer. You get the ice cream cone today. You know, at the water store. That's the big thing in our house. I'm going to the water store because we, you know, we don't drink the tap water. You know, right? It is not in Phoenix. That was an illustration I forgot to use this morning. We showed up in Phoenix like the first day we were there. And we found out real quick, don't drink the tap water. It's terrible. It is not. So we go to the water store and we, we fill up our water jugs. And, and, and whenever we do it, one of the kids gets to come because there's usually an ice cream cone involved. It's called water and ice. They should call it water and ice cream. <laughs> but that's the one, guess who gets to go? It's the one that's been the most behaved. And that's what I'm trying to illustrate to us is that our proximity to God is proportional to our obedience. You go back to John chapter 14, you'll see this in verse 21. John chapter 14, verse 21. There is a requirement of obedience to have a close fellowship with the Lord. He says in verse 21, He that hath my, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Oh, we, so many of us have God's commandments, don't we? We might even have several copies of it. We've got one in our car. We've got one in our bedstand. We've got one, uh, you know, in this room. We've got one at work. We've even got one that we just leave on our favorite church chair, so no, so somebody thinks we're sitting there. You know who you are. People do that. All, that's the weirdest thing. You get to see so many weird things. But I would say weird things, but some things that maybe other people never notice. And when you're when you're in these ministries and things like that, people. Like, church is six days from now. Like, you're already, you're already marking your spot. 
with an extra copy of God's commandments. Oh, we've got God's commandments with us, don't we? We've got that first part down. He that hath my commandments, I'm all set. No, it goes on. And keepeth them. What does he mean by keep them? Don't lose your Bible? No. What he means is, you know, observes them. Obeys them. He keeps them. He does them. He it is that loveth me. <clears throat> you know, it's one thing to say, uh, I love God. Oh, I love God. But we're not keeping his commandments. Well, do we really love God? And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And here it is. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. That's a deep verse. I remember the first time someone showed me that verse, hit me like a ton of bricks. This idea that God would manifest himself to you. Now, what does he mean by that? Don't, get, no, don't go crazy with this and think that God's going to appear in a vision. <laughs> that some, you're going to get close to, you're going to keep God's commandments, which you should anyway, and that some night you're just going to have this you know, glowing orb in your room or something. You know, or you're going to have a vision of Jesus. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about a physical manifestation. You know where God will manifest himself is in your heart. And he'll do it through this word. It, it's, no that's not there for, it, it's no coincidence that that's how that, the order of things goes in that verse. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them. What is there, are his commandments? His word. If I have his word and I keep it and I'm in it and I'm obeying it, I'm going to see Christ in here. And it's going to reflect Christ in my own heart. And I'm going to realize something. That I have God living in me. That I am not alone. That I'm never alone. <clears throat> but it comes with a prerequisite. That prerequisite is obedience. <clears throat> the Bible says in Proverbs 8, I love them that love me, and them that seek me early shall find me. You know, he's saying seek me early doesn't mean just get up in the morning, although that's a good time to do it, and seek God before your day begins. He's saying seek me early in life. Don't, don't wait. And I know, and I'm, I, to some degree, and this is my own testimony, don't wait until you're old to seek God. Seek Him early. Spare yourself <laughs> so many heartaches, young people, and seek Him early. And find God's love early. Love God early and draw close to Him now. <clears throat> you see, God's promise of comfort is to the obedient. We don't, no one here wants to be lonely. Nobody here wants to feel alone. And we would all want this promise of God's comfort to be ours. At least we should. <clears throat> but here's the thing. It's to those that are willing to obey. It's there. It's there for the taking. Any one of us can have it. If we're willing to obey. <clears throat> Let's turn to uh, Psalm 66. 66. Keep something in John. We're going to go back to Psalm 66. And we'll start uh, uh, wrapping this thing up here. In Psalm 66, let's look at verse 16 where the Bible reads, Come and hear all ye that fear the Lord. And I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. You know, that's a, that's a heavy verse in verse 18. You know, the promise of God's willingness to be with you, to comfort you, is based on obedience. And if you regard iniquity in your heart, it says right there, the Lord will not hear me. I'm lonely. I'm all alone down here. I, God, help me. Well, we want to be heard in those instances, don't we? We want God to hear us and answer. We want to pick up the book, His Word, and read it and have God speak to our hearts and answer our prayers through His Word and other things. But if we're regarding iniquity in our heart, if we're disobedient, don't count on it. Don't think it's going to happen because it's not. It says it right there. <clears throat> that if we're not obedient, God's not going to hear us. Turn back to John chapter 10. 
The Bible says in Proverbs 28, He that turneth away his ear from the hearing of the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. Lord, help. Lord, hear me. Lord, uh, be close to me. Whatever it is your prayer is, whatever your prayer is tonight, if you've turned your ear away from the hearing of the law and said, ah, this isn't for me. I can do what I want. You're, that prayer, it doesn't say that God doesn't hear you. It says that prayer is an abomination. That's a strong word. God is offended that you would even begin to make that request when you've been living the way you've been living and doing what you've been doing and not obeying and not keeping his commandments and not following after him. And now all of a sudden you're crying out to him and he says, it's an abomination. <clears throat> that's, that's strong language. If we, if we really valued this promise that God has given us, that I will never leave thee, I will never forsake thee. And look here in John chapter 10, this promise that he's given us throughout his word. In verses 28 and 29. <clears throat> Let's go to verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Promises like this, that we know that God has us, that he's never going to leave us, and we want that to be real. We want that to be true. We want to know that in every ounce of our being and to help us in life when we go through these seasons of loneliness. <clears throat> if we really valued that, you know what we'd do? We'd obey. Whatever it said. Whatever it is that God wanted. See, that, precious, that promise is so precious to me, I'm willing to do anything for it. Then obey. <clears throat> I'm willing to do whatever God says. God says a lot of things. Are you sure about that? God's got a lot of commandments for us. And if we're sitting here drawing a blank on what those might be, maybe it's time to start reading it and finding out for ourselves and getting in church and figuring out what it is that God expects from us. You see, it is a relationship, and again, I'm hesitant to even use that term, but it is what it is. It is a relationship. And like any relationship, it goes two ways. We can't have this one-sided thing where it's all just take, take, take. It's whatever I can get from God. God has some demands too. God has a to-do list for you, for us to fulfill. See, we look at a passage like John chapter 28 and, and, and John 10, 28, and we know this, that our sonship is secure, or daughtership. It doesn't really roll off the tongue the same, but it means the same thing, right? Our, our, our being a child of God, that's settled. We've been born of the, the water. We've been born of the Spirit. It's a one-time event. Your physical birth, your spiritual birth. We, we know that if we're saved today. We've taken care of that. That's secure. That's never going to change. But only obedience will guarantee your fellowship. That's the only thing that's going to guarantee that God is going to be there to be with you through, the, through any season in life is your obedience. Let's go ahead and pray.